And um, you may know a Grinch who uh, maybe just has a little bit of a foul temper, just kind of a little bit um, prickly, a little bitter, just on the edge. Maybe somebody you just don't really want to be around. Maybe they're Grinchy this Christmas season. Maybe you are that person who's a little Grinchy, who's a little cynical, who's a little bitter, who's just a little on edge, who people don't want to be around. Regardless of whether you're going to be around one, regardless of whether you think you are one, today is the day for you because we are finishing up a three-week mini series on the mouth. And, um, you know, it's an unusual topic for Christmas, for a Christmas series to talk about our mouths and how what we say and how we say it and to whom we say it, how important these things are. But I probably, I think I can say with certainty, at least in recent history, these last three weeks, I have received more feedback from many of you in first service and also this service, also people online who God has been working on in such powerful ways that the way you're viewing your life, your families, your relationships is changing. And that's exactly what I want. It means that we're on the right track. It means that we as a church family are heading the right direction because the world around us, they know what's in our heart by what we say and how we say it. And sometimes Christians were shameful in the way we communicate to those closest to us and also to those further and further out in concentric circles. And so today we're gonna finish up James' statement in James chapter three. And in the book of James, each of the chapters of James, Jesus' half-brother has something to say about the tongue. It was that important, but our focus has been James chapter three. And then we're gonna move to some instructions from the apostle Paul that clarify what we are supposed to do with our mouths. Anybody feeling mouthy today? Has anybody already ruined it? Anybody already woken up today and you prayed the prayer? God, let me get to the end of my day without saying anything I can regret. I prayed that prayer. How long did you make it? Have you gone an entire day this last week or this last couple of weeks where you've been at the end of your day and you have patted yourself on the back and you've said, self, you did a great job. You didn't say anything to anyone all day that you would take back that was unkind, that was unthoughtful. If you've done that, then that's tremendous. I'm not 100% sure I've gone a day. I have gone a while, but my problem is I still catch in myself. I catch myself after I say it and I'm like, ooh, I shouldn't have said that. I wanna start catching myself before I do these things. That's the way to make it to the end of a complete day. So we're gonna keep working on that today. And we're gonna pick up in James' words as he really just puts an exclamation point at the end of this passage. And then he just kind of drops the mic. And uh, today's going to be a fun day because we have kids who are going to be singing in during the worship time after my first section of teaching. And then I'll come back and we'll apply this in a way that's going to challenge you. And, and you may or may not want to do it. I don't know. First service, everybody said that they would consider doing it, but not everyone said they, would, they were going to. So I hope I at least get that same response or maybe better. You guys have already had another hour. You're more awake. You're alert. You're in tune. You're all much more spiritual than first service, right? Much more spiritually minded. So of course, we're all going to be on the same page. Let's look together. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings. Curse means to dismiss, to demean, to disrespect. Um, it's uh, just a negative term. It doesn't mean to swear at. It just means that uh, in general, that we are dismissing humans. They've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Now, James is just making analogies. He's making um, kind of crazy analogies. It's like for those of you who are University of Iowa football fans, it's like saying, uh, can any offense come out of Iowa City? No, of course it can't, right? Um, I just see how I did that. I alienated half of you guys. And then the other half I didn't. You're like, we're going to listen the whole service today. Um, they still can manage to win, right? Without scoring any, well, the last week when, anyway, we won't talk about that. All right. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing, my brothers and sisters. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? No, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. If you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Christ, what we say has to be consistent. And when we say we praise God, we love God, and we curse human beings, we dismiss human beings, we speak disrespectfully, we disregard, we demean, there's an inconsistency that has to be resolved. You cannot be both. And then James drops the mic. He's like, see ya, that's it, bye, he's gone. I mean, he says a little bit more, but let's, let's continue together. 
um, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father and, you know, he's going on and on and with the same tongue we praise him and we also curse and, and he drops the mic at the end of it and he's like, of course you can't do that. And then he goes on to an entirely different thought, comes back later and picks up the same thought. But I need instructions, I need help. I need to figure out a little bit more about what this subject is, is about it and how I can apply it and how I can, can live differently. And you probably need that same help. And so we pick from one of the best uh, sources on this material that we could ever have, the Apostle Paul, who used to be called Saul, who was very, very good with his mouth. He had a very quick wit. He could speak well in defending the faith. He was also able to speak really well before he became a Christian, when he criticized the faith, when he arrested Christians, when he killed Christians. He could bite with that tongue. He could also build up with that tongue. And he writes some instructions to a group of people who he really loves, a church, and they're Gentiles. The church is uh, uh, made up of people who used to be non-Jews. Now, Gentiles back in this day uh, served a pantheon of gods. They were not very moral. They uh, had a, a culture where backbiting and power uh, was um, really esteemed. Women had no merit or benefit beyond just being a, a, a child bearer and somebody who kept the home. Slaves were kept. People who were weak were exploited. The most powerful were the strongest and the ones who could connive and scheme. It was a, a society that was really dark, really negative. And the Apostle Paul starts this by saying, you guys used to be Gentiles. And remember, uh, don't act like that. Don't act like the way that you used to be, the people you used to be. So for us to apply this, we have to say the same thing. Do you remember what it was like before you were a Christian? If you are a Christian, maybe you were six when you became a believer and you have to imagine what it might be like if you weren't a believer. You have to think of the values of the world, your shadow self, the way that you could be drawn towards sin. And you have to say, remember the way of the world. Remember the person that I used to be before I gave myself to Christ, before I became a follower. Remember that person. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and true holiness. He said your old self was corrupted by deceitful desires. Deceitful desires, desires that lie to you. Anybody ever bought a new vehicle ever? Sometimes buying a new vehicle works out really well, brand new, but sometimes as soon as you buy it, you just have regret. You wish you hadn't bought it. Now, I bought a vehicle one time when I was younger. I had just gotten married, our kids were young. They had 0% financing, they had uh, nothing down. And I thought, what better time to buy a new vehicle than to go buy something with 0% financing and nothing down. And so I remember going and buying it because we were taking a cross country trip and I just had myself all worked up because I needed it. My boys had to have the space, the captain's chairs in the back with the DVD. And, and you know, I, the payment was high, but you know, I could probably make the payment. I mean, after all, my kids deserve it. My wife needs to ride in luxury in this brand new, this was a suburban brand back in the day, a long time ago. And um, I remember going in and signing the papers on this thing. And I mean, I thought, boy, would this make me happy. This was gonna be the purchase. I, I really, really wanted it. Now, for you, buying a new car may not be a very big deal because you can afford it, it's wise. For me, it wasn't a wise decision, shouldn't have purchased it. And as soon as I bought it, I was driving across country going through Nevada of all places. And I realized I got to make a payment on this thing in 30 days. And then I have to make another payment for six more years. And I make this amount of money and this payment is this amount of money. And I had not even driven 400 miles before I hated that car. It was the deceitful desire. But these desires pop up in different ways things we say, things we think, things we take, people we sleep with, values we adopt, substances we abuse, shortcuts. A desire that lies to you, that promises you something and never delivers. It's the desire that whispers in your ear after you already experienced the disappointment that comes. It whispers in your ear next time, next time the next desire, the next person, the next job, the next situation, the next expectation. And then once that one fails us, it's the next time, a deceitful desire. And Paul says your old way of life was full of deceitful desires. The desire to elevate yourself, the desire to win, the desire to exploit, the desire to have power, the desire. And he said, it just lies to you, filled with lies. 
and you've put on a new identity, just like taking off an old set of clothes and putting on a brand new set of clothes. You're a different person. And because you're a different person, you have to think a different way. And so he says, your old life was corrupted by deceitful desires, but put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now let's keep going. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Have you heard that phrase before? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Anyone ever heard that? If you're a Christian, you're a churchy like I am. Um, just so I can see, I just want to see this. It'll be interesting to me. How many of you grew up in church? Raise your hands if you grew up in church. Okay, how many of you didn't grow up in church? There's lots of us who didn't, all, lots of us. Every one of our, our uh, new uh, member classes, our City Connect classes, we have lots of people who didn't. And I love that. I love the fact that you're here. Respect the fact that you're here. Sometimes I say things that I just assume you know, because I know them because I was taught them when I was a kid. And that's not fair for me to assume that you know them too, because you haven't yet been taught. Some people would use this passage of scripture and hold it over our head as children so that we wouldn't say any naughty words or any potty words. Now, I wanna say right off the bat, we shouldn't say any naughty words or any potty words. If you're a kid, I'm not giving you permission to go home and drop a four letter word because your mama's gonna wash your mouth out. They don't do that anymore, right? That's abuse now when you wash the mouth out with soap. Back when I was a kid, that was called a natural and logical consequence. Um, I'm not saying that. Swearing is uh, unprofessional. It shows a lack of intelligence. It's not communicative. People don't take you seriously if your mouth is full of profanity, but that's not what this passage is talking about. Even a little bit, Paul has no intention of communicating potty words in this. Um, when the apostle Paul says, you're living a different way, you serve a different master, you're no longer being tricked and deceived by these desires. He says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. The word unwholesome means rotten, stinky, like um, a fourth grade boy's shoes if they put them up wet in the closet after they start to fester and smolder. And those, you know, do you know the smell? That communicates to me so well, because I had two boys and they shared a room for a while. And I'm telling you what, their shoes could smell so bad. We had to leave them outside. We had to buy new shoes because they smelled so bad, the old shoes, and they weren't even that old. So if you can resonate with that analogy, um, rotting fish, how about this? The Des Moines River at low tide. When they, when they like stop the flow of the Des Moines River and it's just down to like a trickle and it has all the foam in the corners of it from all of the pesticides from upriver. And you know, there's fish in there, but they're not the healthy kind of fish. They're the fish that wouldn't be there if they had a choice and they start to die. And you get down by the river and you smell it and you're like, something just ain't right in Des Moines. That's the kind of smell we're talking about. Unwholesome words, the ones that are just, something just ain't right. These are nasty, these are sudsy, they're dirty, they're blah, but they're not dirty because they're four letter or because they're gateway words like we were instructed so many times as children to watch out for. They're disgusting because they tear people down and they're destructive. And that's what Paul's talking about. And you can't read this passage in its entirety without coming to this conclusion, and it's so much easier for us just to say, well, I'm not going to swear, and the world will know I'm a Christian. Congratulations. But what Paul is concerned about is if the world hears the way you talk to and about people, your own brothers and sisters, and also those who aren't saved, are they going to be drawn toward Christ, or are they going to be repelled from Christ because of our mouths? And if our mouth is the detractor from our testimony, then we're filled with unwholesome words. And he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit because when we talk bad about people who God loves, God takes it personally. And sometimes we put ourselves in that place and it's not a safe place to be. Now, I wanna talk about unwholesome words real quick, and I'm gonna give you three characteristics of unwholesome words because we're not supposed to let any come out of our mouth. Now, you'll find yourself in these three categories, I think. I, I don't know, I hope so. In some way, maybe not the most extreme way, but in some way, but there's three characteristics, there's three Ds here, and we're gonna build on this in the next section, so pay attention. Excuse me. Demeaning words, that's an unwholesome word. 
I am mean and I insult people to their face or behind their back. Now, not everybody is bold enough to insult someone to their face. You got to be kind of a fighter to do that, right? Because even in our time, if you insult somebody to your face, to their face, I mean, there's a good chance that you're going to get punched in the face or something's going to happen. So, I mean, but online, oh my goodness, aren't we brave when we're online, when we're behind a keyboard or a phone? The things we say about people we know, we don't know, who believe something different, who think something different. We insult people, the stuff we say behind their back about their appearance, about where they came from, the way they talk, how much money they have, their education. The stuff that we say to ourselves, the stuff we say to people close to us. We find ourselves oftentimes being so critical and so demeaning that it grieves the Holy Spirit of God who says, I'm for them. So how can you tear them down? The second, degrading. You don't make the grade and you don't measure up, which means I set the grade. I set the scale. I am the professor. You're the student. If you don't measure up in life, I'm going to evaluate you and I'm gonna tell you what you need to do better. And I'm gonna tell you how you need to improve so that you can rise to my level and I'll accept you. How disgusting is that? But often we find ourselves slipping into these patterns or these traps because we like to focus on the areas where we're strong and degrade people who aren't strong in those areas. But we like to ignore the areas where we're weak and call them oversights or omissions or just the way I am, right? And Jesus says to us, did you make the grade? No. Well, I didn't expect you to improve and come up to my level before I gave my life for you. So who are you to grieve me by setting yourself as the standard for intellectual beauty, for spiritual beauty, for educational beauty, for geographic beauty for you name it, political, religious, we degrade. And number three, disrespect, unwholesome words, demeaning, degrading, disrespectful. Disrespect just essentially means you don't matter. You're not important enough for me to give the courtesy of a respectful or polite reply. I have a circle of people who I want to be in my sphere of existence and I don't want you there, but you're there, so I have to deal with you. Disrespectful. You don't really matter. You're not important. And I don't really care about you. Now, we don't necessarily say that to somebody. If you do, that's pretty harsh. But we act like that around people. Sometimes you see it. It's evidenced and demonstrated sometimes in high school and junior high. I remember I moved to a new school when I was in eighth grade. All these kids had known each other forever. And I bounced from one friend group to the other. And all these years later, I can still remember going up and standing next to a group of kids. I was from South Florida. They were from Tennessee, waiting to see if I was gonna be accepted, standing there, realizing that I wasn't important enough to be acknowledged or included in their group where they didn't say you don't belong or you don't fit, but they showed it. And friends, it's extreme when you're talking about high school, but it's shameful when it happens in church. And it may have happened to you in a church somewhere or around a group of Christians and you felt like you didn't fit or you didn't belong because for whatever reason, you didn't meet the standard. You didn't measure up. That they didn't really want you there. And if that happened to you, I'm sorry that that happened to you. And I, I promise you that as much as we can help it, it will never happen to you here. With the apostle Paul, he goes right to the heart of human living and relationships. And he says, do not let any of these words come out of your mouth these demeaning words, the degrading words, the disrespectful words. And I love the fact that he sets this up, right? But I want 
more information. I'm like, Paul, okay, you're going to tell me to do it. And I'm going to say, yep, I'll do it. And then you got to tell me how to do it because I'm not that smart when it comes to figuring this stuff out. And James has already told us no human can tame the tongue. Remember that? No human can tame the tongue. Remember what we did first week? We said, be quick to listen, slow to speak, quick to, we need to do this just real quick. I was getting ready to close this first section and just like walk off the stage in a dramatic moment. We need to review, okay? Quick to listen, hands slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the kind of righteousness that God desires. And then last week we talked about the way we choose to talk and gossip. We talked about angry words and critical words, but we talked about gossipy words and how we can take a bucket of water and put them out, how we can fan the flame by sharing and spreading, or how we can just listen and allow it to continue on and just kind of feed the fire. What our responsibility is as Christians, well, this week, friends, we are talking about changing our lives, living differently. And the people close to you, closest to you, are gonna notice the first. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you. Well, as I mentioned to you a minute ago, the apostle Paul kind of just stops at this section in scripture and changes themes, or at least he goes to an instructive sort of a, of a tone instead of just a descriptive kind of a tone or, or he's giving us, he's getting practical. How about that? That's just a better way to say it. And that's what I need. I need somebody to get practical with me because I wanna know how to do this stuff because time is running out. Now, time is running out for all of us because um, every day we age, we're closer to, you know, the end of our lives, which is just the reality of it. But time's running out for me faster than it is for some of you. And who knows when our last day is going to be, right? I have a birthday in uh, this month in December. I turned 54, which for some of you seems ancient. For some of you, you're like, ha, 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 you're just a child, right? Um, but to me, you know, time's running out. And Pastor Dan and I have talked a lot uh, together in our time together about what kind of old person do we want to be? Because we're not there yet, but we're getting there. And you know, if we don't plan for that right now, we're just going to be the kind of old person that we just happen to end up. And you know, people like that, right? You know, the kind of old people that just sort of happen to end up that way. And the problem is, is that if we're not careful, the older we get, the stronger our opinions get, um, the more we like to share our opinions. And unfortunately, the less influence we have on people who need desperately to hear the wisdom that we gain at some point down the line as we age, because we have not laid the foundation of relationship with the people who are in our lives, of building up and of benefiting with our words. And we expect them just to listen to our principles and our correction, and they don't. They fear our text messages. They don't like seeing our caller ID on their phones. They're worried about sitting next to you at a Christmas dinner or being across the living room from you at Thanksgiving because you're not trustworthy. They're just not 100% sure if you care enough about relationship or if you care about being right. And you're just gonna blast them. And unfortunately, the older we get, sometimes the shorter our, our fuse gets, our filter goes. And man, we're trying so hard to put the right stuff in now so that when the time comes that Dan and I become wise and he's getting there faster than me, and it's not yet, someday in the future, we're gonna become wise. The people close to us are gonna to wanna to hear what we have to say and not just think we're a couple bitter, angry old men who just are upset and caustic and crotchety and grinchy. And there's plenty of those, right? Everyone fears them, nobody respects them. They're the relative you talk about, you don't talk to. And sometimes they're the last ones to know because self-righteous people are often not self-aware. And it scares me to death because as I age, I want a softer heart, a more compassionate spirit and an approachable nature. And that's my prayer for myself. And I wanna be filled with words that are building words that are for the benefit of the people around me, those closest to me and working itself out in concentric circles. Because life's not just about saying happy things. Now you can say, Pastor Rick, 
This all sounds very churchy, but at some point you actually have to tell somebody something they don't want to hear, and that's true. But if you haven't laid the foundation relationally with the people who are closest to you, they're never going to listen to you no matter how true you are. If you have not built them up and you have not benefited them in the words that you've deposited along the way, in a ratio of at least 90-10, where you're not full of critique and criticism and sarcasm, but you're full of a spirit of trying to genuinely contribute being for the people in your lives, it doesn't matter what you've learned because nobody wants to hear it. So Paul's stopping us in our tracks and he's saying, hey, here's the way to do it. This is so important. Here's the way to do it. No matter how old you are, it's not too late. Here's the way to do it. He starts off by saying, get rid of something. I love to get rid of stuff. Not all my stuff. I have some stuff you can't touch. My stuff, I'm not getting rid of it. Your stuff, I love to get rid of. My wife's stuff doesn't bother me a bit to get rid of it. My old stuff, hey, case by case. And Dan and Lori and Joy and I have been in sort of a competition, not really a competition, but kind of, of just getting rid of stuff. You know, we got a house, Dan and Lori have a house and we've accumulated stuff. We both have adult children and, and um, you know, just too much stuff to me just seems weird. It just seems like if I need a bunch of stuff, then there's some kind of pathology associated with that. And I don't want that kind of pathology. So I want to get rid of my stuff so I can deal with my other pathologies. And so we've just been eliminating stuff we don't need. And uh, Lori texted the other day and she's like, hey, you'll be proud of me because we had this conversation at lunch a few weeks ago. I've been down in the basement packing up stuff and getting rid of stuff. And I'm like, how much stuff? And she goes, a whole Denali worth of stuff we gave to Goodwill. Dan's got a Denali. He's bigger than my car. But yesterday, Joy and I, we went on a stuff purging exercise again and I filled up a forerunner full of stuff. So it's not as good as Dan and Lori's, but I'm gonna have to make two trips, but it's close because I got rid of some stuff. Now listen to this, keep that in mind. Here we go, get rid of, this is what Paul says, get rid of all bitterness. That's the word he's using, get rid of, get rid. You know the stuff you have that you've accumulated over time that's down in the basement, that's stashed away in cupboards, that you don't need, that you think you need, that because it's around, there's a pathology associated with it. It gives you some kind of security or identity. He's saying, get rid of it. Now, when I got rid of it yesterday, I've just got a wild hair. There was no football on. My message was prepared. So I went downstairs and in my closet, I had clothes I wanted to donate to Goodwill. It'd been a long time since I donated. And so I filled six bags full of clothes to go donate to Goodwill. I don't need them. Somebody's cold this winter who needs them. Somebody doesn't have clothes that they can benefit from what I had stashed in the back of my closet. So I went downstairs and I'm filling up these bags and here's what I did to get rid of my stuff. I took the bag and I, these are trash bags, right? And I don't use those wimpy kitchen bags when I get rid of stuff. I use those lawn bags. I cinch them up, right? And you tie a knot in them mm, like that. And then you take them up. And ladies, this is what you don't do. You don't put them in the back of your car and leave them there for four months. You don't do that. Don't do that. I mean, has anybody ever done that? You just put your donated stuff back there and you, know, you get in the car, it's like, you put this in there six months ago. Why is it still back there? Now it's your car, right? It doesn't really matter. Probably men do that too. I don't, so I can you know, poke fun at people who do because I'm good at throwing stuff away. Um, but if you're still on the back of your trunk, you can go get it and bring it back inside, right? And you want to be able to get rid of your stuff Well, you can't go get it. It's like, I'm getting rid of it, but it's in my car, but it's not gone. So this is what I did yesterday because I know I wanted to get rid of it. So I put it in the bag. I cinched it up. Well, Goodwill doesn't have anybody working back in their donation station at four o'clock on a Saturday. So I went into Goodwill and I said, I got stuff I want to get rid of. And the lady said, you're going to have to bring it inside. And I went, I didn't want to bring it inside. But then I knew if I kept it in my car, it's still my stuff. So I took it inside. I put it in a bin, pushed that bin to a guy and said, take my stuff. That's getting rid of your stuff. When Paul says, get rid of, that's what he means. Put it in a garbage bag, cinch it up, tie it up, put it in your car, take it to Goodwill, hand it to somebody, put it in a bin, push it away. You no longer have possession. So what's the stuff? Bitterness is the first thing he says, get rid of. He says, get rid of all bitterness. And then he goes and he sort of develops the word. These are all individual words that sort of contribute. They paint a a picture of the same theme. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander among every form of malice. Be kind to each other. Well, it's a political season. I don't have to be kind to people. Yes, we do. You can't make fun of somebody because they believe something different than you. It's shameful, but we do it. A different religion, a different perspective, a different point of view. Well, it's fair game if I don't agree with them. No, it's not. There's a time and a way to speak the truth. 
And there's a kind and compassionate way to speak the truth. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another. I've got nine points in my notes on forgiveness and I'm not giving any of them to you because we don't have time. So you can go ah, like that. Nine things I'm gonna share with you soon, but you know, not today, but they're there. Forgiving each other just as Christ, in Christ, God forgave you. Get rid of bitterness. Bitterness does not build or benefit. It's being irritable and unforgiving. It's a state of perpetual angst, like the Grinch. You know anybody that's just in a state of perpetual angst? They're just agitated. Man, the world's a terrible place, and I don't like anybody. And you're know, just prickly, just ugh. Bitterness is caused oftentimes by unforgiveness. It's caused by somebody having said something to you that wasn't true or kind, that became part of your identity. Someone doing something to you, you thinking the world owes you something different and you don't get it. And the world and people don't owe you anything. God gave us salvation through our faith, by his grace, as a free gift, because you and I don't deserve anything and can't contribute toward anything that's really morally, intrinsically, and perfectly good. And the things that happen to us are wounds and they're real. But if it causes bitterness, it drives us away from who Jesus wants us to be. And Paul says, put your bitterness in a trash bag, even if it's unresolved, even if it feels today like it did yesterday when it happened. Put it in a trash bag, cinch that thing up. Not those wimpy kitchen trash bags, those lawn bags that you pay extra for. Tie that knot, put them in the back of your car, take them to Goodwill and hand them to the clerk so you no longer have possession of it. Well, I wanna be bitter. No, you don't. Because a person who's bitter cannot be a builder. The two are in direct contrast to each other. So let's pick up the pace real quick here. Bitterness, get rid of it. There's some other stuff we got to get rid of. Some other words. I think we've got words. Rage, a fiery feeling ready to explode. You guys probably know what that is like, where your temper is just on edge and you're just kind of waiting for, you know, someone to say the wrong thing or to see the wrong commercial or for the news to come up or for your phone to go off. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Someone to cut you off can't tell you how many people have said, preacher, thank you so much for talking about driving the last few weeks. And it's always the spouse of the person who drives bad. He's such a bad driver and you're going to keep me alive by talking about driving in the spirit. I don't even remember really saying stuff because I'm not that great a driver either. But I mean, you know, when we drive, it's just that rage. It's like, ah, right, just right there. That's brawling, shouting it out. Whether it's your personality or not. It is my personality to get emphatic and demonstrative when I talk. I can get loud and I can walk back and forth when I'm talking to Joy and I can just, and I just weave this whole, and, and I look over and Joy is just like sitting there with this blank look on her face. I hadn't paid attention to anything I've said. She doesn't communicate that way. And as far as she's concerned, I'm yelling at her. As far as I'm concerned, I'm conversating, right? Listen to me, woman, I'm talking to you. And she's like, I can't, it's my responsibility to make sure that the way I communicate to her is gonna be a, in a way that builds her up and is for her benefit, not just because it makes me feel good. If I don't get my emotions out by the way I talk, then who cares if I get my emotions out with the way I talk? If the person who's listening to me isn't built up and benefited by the words and the way I say it, shame on me, shame on you. Slander, to erase somebody from significance, you're not important enough to me, you don't matter. So I'm going to talk about you to other people, to erase you from my existence, to, to damage you any way that I possibly can, to blaspheme you, to slander. Malice, get rid of all malice, is just a bad-hearted person. It's just somebody that just seems to be wired wrong. They've kind of given up. They've decided the world's a terrible place and they hate the world. And instead of just being generally grouchy, they're just foul. They're just rotten. They've just gone past the point of no return. Caustic in a way that's toxic. These all sort of progress. And as we age, they progress 
because there's time and we either become more Christ-like, softer, more compassionate, more kind-hearted, more tender, or we become more bitter, cynical, jaded, and proud. Anger just lurking below the surface, ready to explode, willing to slander anybody who comes into our realm or our sphere. And at the end of the day, we just become one of those people that's just a bad person. In Matthew 15, we see that the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And this is what we're supposed to do. Speak to each other the way that God speaks to us. What kind of words does God speak over you? What kind of words has Jesus spoken to you? That's the kind of word or the kind of words we're supposed to speak over each other. Have you been speaking the kind of words that Jesus would speak already today? This morning when you woke up, yesterday afternoon when no one else was looking, what more important thing can we do than to speak to people the way that Jesus would speak to them if he were here? because that's what he's left us to do. So we're gonna do something that's not gonna be easy and I'm gonna lead you up to it. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna try one more time. You see that leadership? That's excellent leadership right there. You're all just right here in the palm of my hand, just ready to do whatever I ask. It doesn't appear so, but I'm gonna ask you again. Are you ready to at least hear what I'm gonna ask you to do? Yeah. Yes, okay, this is it. I'm gonna read this to you again. I'm gonna ask you two questions and then I'm gonna lay it on you. Here's what I'm gonna to read to you this passage. We're gonna read through it. I'm gonna read it to you. And um, I want you to pay attention to it. And then I'm gonna ask you two questions. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by speaking to people in a shameful way because our salvation was sealed by the Holy Spirit of God from the day of our redemption. So first of all, what do you have to work on? You don't have to answer out loud, but what do you have to work on? Do you have anything to work on? I got something to work on. I hope you have something that you've found along the way over the last three weeks to work on. If you don't, if you came with somebody, ask them on the way home, just say, hey, you know, I think I've mastered this whole tongue thing. You won't point out some things maybe that, that I need to work on. See if they have nothing to say. Now, um, the next question is gonna sort of dovetail with that. The first question is, what do I have to work on? The second question is, who in my life is hoping the most that I work quickly? And why don't I love them enough to change? Why do I prefer me over them? Why is my mouth more important than their heart? Why am I unwilling to speak the words that Jesus would speak to these people who are closest to me, who are so desperate for us to change? Because words affect people. And it begins with the ones, and I say this all the time, who are closest to us, our influence, and we're held responsible for those who are closest to us. And it works itself out in concentric circles. So here's the exercise. Here's what I want you to consider doing. Here's what I hope you do. I want you to pick three people who are in your sphere of influence in your life. Not somebody who's wounded you deeply, who you haven't seen in 30 years, who you need to forgive or you need to resolve something. That's not at all what I'm talking about. Somebody in your sphere of influence, somebody in your life, your family, somebody in your friend group, someone you're likely to see maybe over the next few weeks, somebody um, that uh, you know is just sort of around, right? These three people are gonna be around you, these three people. Two of these people I want you to pick, uh, I want you to pick people who are really easy for you to build up and to speak for the benefit of, okay? I want you to pick two. And the reason I want you to pick two is because some of you don't say the things that people need to hear in your life, even though you think them. And things that we choose not to say that we should say, we're held responsible for just like saying the things we shouldn't say to people who shouldn't be hearing them. 
we're responsible to build the people up in our lives and to say things that are gonna benefit them. And sometimes we men especially, oh, we just assume they know it. Well, she knows I love her and I'll tell her differently if things change, right? I don't gotta tell my kids that they're special to me. They know I'm, I'm just not communicative. I'm a man. Uh-uh, that's a cop-out. And we may be wired in a way that makes it difficult for us, but it does not absolve or excuse us. So pick two people in your life who are close to you, who it should be easy for you to say something to that builds them up and is for their benefit. And then I want you to pick somebody that's the most irritating person you can think of, who you can't imagine saying something that builds up and benefits. Someone in your friend, in your family, your circle, right? You know who I'm talking about. If you don't, I can tell you how the staff and I talk, the pastors and I and our staff, we were talking about this on Tuesday and I'm like, hey, I'm thinking about asking our friends in church to do something. And they're like, what? And I told them and they're like, wow. And I said, do you think they'll do it? And they're like, well, we don't know if we wanna do it. So we talked about it for a while and we all came to the same conclusion that we were gonna do it, but it took us a while to get there. And especially this one, pick the person who's the most difficult for you. It's the person who's in your family or your friend group. And when you get cousins and second cousins and aunts and uncles and in-laws and, and daughters-in-laws, and I mean, eventually there's somebody that's gonna be around you that's prickly. If you got nobody in your family like that, then that is such a blessing. You are like an anomaly. You should be in a museum. I mean, it's really, really unusual. But if it's not your family or you're not gonna be around anybody, you're gonna be around somebody. You pick that person. I've got that person. I've picked them. I had to think about it. I want you to pick them. It's the person you're usually, if you're like at a gathering and you leave, it's the first person that you wanna talk you know what about as soon as you get in the car? It's that person. Can you believe that? You know, you know, come on, you know what I'm talking about. Do you not know? Is there no one? You never get in the car with your wife and you don't ever say anything about anybody? You just, oh, wasn't that a delightful party? Our family is so functional. I'm just so blessed by God to be around all these people who build me. No, you talk you know, about people too. It's that one person who you're like, I cannot believe cousin Eddie said that. Can you believe he, it's that person. And there may be a lot of things in that person's life that you really can't build up and you can't encourage, but there's something. And I want you to find that thing that you can say to them. Again, we're not talking about offenses and estrangement. I'm talking about people who are in your life, difficult people. Something that you can say to them that builds them up and is for their benefit. So I'm making it easy for you to that are easier, one that's really, really hard. And this is what I want you to do. I want you first of all, to prepare a blessing. Now you're like, that sounds weird. What do you want me to do? I want you to walk into your family gathering or to your office Christmas party. And I want you to say, I have prepared a blessing for you and I'm going to bestow on you my most difficult person in my life, a blessing straight from God, right? Don't do that, that's weird. I'm not at all suggesting that you do that. What I'm suggesting is that you prepare something in advance that you wanna say so you don't blank out in the moment when you look at them because they're irritating before and they're gonna be irritating when you see them. And if it's the one person that's difficult to talk to, you're gonna see the irritating stuff first. And if you're like me, you're gonna go, I'm irritated, not laying the blessing, prepare in advance. Prepare what you're gonna say, both to those two people who it's easy to say something to and those, that one person that's really, really difficult. Prepare a blessing in advance. What's a blessing? Something that is designed to build them up and it is for their benefit. It's not a backhanded compliment. It's not a criticism sort of guised or disguised as a compliment or as an encouragement. It's a genuine heartfelt statement that you've prepared in advance for somebody that's simply for their benefit and to build them up. I want you to prepare this in advance and I want you to pray for the right time because timing is everything both when you say it to the people who are easiest for you to say it to. I mean, I try to encourage my adult kids all the time, but you gotta catch them at the right moment, right? They're like, dad, don't be weird, right? I mean, what are you talking about, right? I mean, it's gotta be the right moment because all of a sudden, if you're not normally emotional, when you get emotional, they're like, what are you dying? Is something going on? I mean, they don't know, right? You gotta pray for that, right? You gotta, you gotta, slap, and, but you pray, you pray in advance. You say, God, give me the right timing for this prepared blessing that I have to give to these people, these two people. And it doesn't have to be two, if you got more, Go, please, go, go more, go big. And then the third thing is I want you to pass it on with sincerity. And um, watch what happens. 
Is it gonna change the person who you uh, speak to? Maybe. I mean, in some cases, it could change the whole dynamic of a relationship. It could change somebody's self-image. It could, it might, it might not. But what it is gonna do, it is gonna change you. We're gonna be builders. We're not going to be bitter. We're going to give blessings. We're not going to take. Our words are gonna be words that give life so that people can see Jesus. And I'm gonna give these words with sincerity after I've prayed for them and prepared them in advance. And I'm gonna watch God change my heart as he conforms my mouth or transforms my mouth. Because anyone who gets control of his tongue gets, has control of their whole body. Once our tongue falls into line, our life falls into line. When people begin to consistently hear the things that come out of our mouth and it makes them draw toward Jesus, we're on the right track. And I think we finally understood what the apostle Paul and James were saying in the first place. So here's how we're gonna conclude, the same way we did last week with a psalm. I've thought about this psalm multiple days this week. If you didn't write this psalm down, if you didn't put this as a sticky note on the rear view mirror of your car, on your bathroom mirror, on your phone, not a sticky note on your phone, but type it into your phone, your computer, put this somewhere where you can see it, where you can remember it. This psalm will help you. It has helped me so many times these last few weeks. I will ask God for help every day because no human can tame the tongue. So here it is. God set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Allow me to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Slow to become angry because human anger doesn't bring out the right relationships that God desires. And when I choose to talk, let my words be the words that Jesus would say if Jesus were here. May I build people up, help them become better. Because that's what Jesus would do. So when the time comes and as the time comes, they'll see Jesus and you'll have the opportunity to explain why and how you live a different way. I wanna pray for you. And as we apply this together, this can be a different and best Christmas that you've ever had. Father, thank you so much for my friends and for the time that we've spent together. And I pray that you would, uh, wherever this hits each of us, boy, we have offendees and offendors here. I think all of us are maybe both at the same time. And offensive is certainly nothing that we need to be in our nature and our character and our demeanor because your gospel offends. So many times we blame the offense on the gospel, but in reality, it's just us. We're just too impatient and self-righteous and angry. So focused on truth that we forget about righteousness. And I thank you for the apostle Paul reminding us through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that no unwholesome word is supposed to come out of our mouth everything we say should be for the building up of the people in our lives, benefiting them as they understand who Jesus is and draw closer to him. So I pray, Father, that the trash that we have to take out of our lives, that we take it out. You point it out, that we bundle it up and haul it off that we give our mouths to you this Christmas season as a gift because we belong to you and we want to live like it. I pray these things with confidence in Jesus' name. And I pray them with my friends here, Father, and I love them. But I know you love them even more than I do. And we live in a world that makes it so hard to live for you. But I know that you are for them. And that if we let you, you'll give us the strength and the ability to live a different way. And that's my prayer for us as a church, that as we close this year out and enter anew, 
that through your power and strength, we would live together a different way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.